One of the greatest thrills of my life was the very first Billy Graham crusade that I went to. Uh, it was... It was in Ohio. I was serving there at the time as the director of evangelism of all the Southern Baptist churches in Ohio. And so I worked with all this. I had the privilege. They would call me. The, the organization would and say, we need you to help us rally those churches together. And says, and as a result, since you've not been to one of the crusades yet, says, well, we want you on the field when the invitation comes so you can help with resources and encourage the, the counselors. And if the counselors run into something that they can't answer, they, they, they have people like you hanging around. I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds good. And so we went through all the training, and what you, they do is they enlist all these counselors from all the different churches. The moment that Billy Graham says, come down to the front, they all come on down, and they, they, they're in lines. They know where they're to go to greet people who are coming down to make decisions for Christ. And I remember I was there right, at the very, right in the very front, and I'm watching people come down when he says that. I'm thinking, I wonder how many of them are counselors, but I couldn't find any counselors. They were all broken people, people who needed a change. I mean, weeping crying out, looking for somebody to help them take this next step. I just couldn't get over it. I mean, I, I, immediately I wanted to jump in, but I knew I couldn't because I, I needed to find a counselor so I could help them all. So I'd bring some other counselors in, but I, everything inside of me wanted to just link up with one of those people and say, yeah, what can I do? How can I help you? It'll break your heart when you see that many broken people come down. And I, I've been to at least six, maybe seven crusades since that time. And I, I would fly in to help them with volunteers, or, or I'd be part of it. I was, part, I was the pastor here when we did it in Tampa. And just, it was so exhilarating to watch our folks, you, you went on the buses over there. We, I mean, I think we had five buses that we drove to Tampa with lots of people who didn't know Christ. And we invited them, and you were on the field with them crying, encouraging them, leading them to Jesus. There's no greater thrill than to help a person come to Christ. But th that, was a, that was just a perfect situation because Dr. Graham when he preached what he was saying is let me tell you the truth about God the truth about you and you want to know how to fix that problem you need to come and he would talk about how you need to repent repent means to to turn from the way you've been going and turn to God and all of these people would come well that's sort of what we, we want to talk about the next four weeks in the small groups that meet right after this service you're going to be studying this book called sharing Jesus without freaking out because most people freak out when they think about sharing Jesus. They'll do, they'll do anything but share Jesus. But, but there's something inside. I don't want to intimidate them. I don't want to give them the wrong answer. I, I'm afraid that I'll do it wrong and I'll mess it up. You, listen, you can't mess it up. God is bigger than that. But when you're in the small groups over the next four weeks, what you're going to see is this one pro good friend of mine who's a professor at Southeastern Seminary, and he wrote this book called Sharing Jesus Without Freaking Out, and he goes into much detail about how do you do that? How do you make a friend... How do you treat people as a friend rather than as a project? Because I mean, that's what it is. When you start seeing people as things, it messes everything up. God put you on this earth to be a friend. And friends talk to other friends about things that mean the most to them, including Jesus. So that's what you're going to do in the small groups. But while we're together here in the big sessions, I'm not going to be taking, you know, talking to you about what's in that book. You'll only get that in the small groups. So you want to make sure you do that when you leave today. There are small groups meeting all over the campus. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to identify a key, a, a type of person that you're going to run into that God is wanting you to share Jesus with. And today, I want to talk to you about how to talk to guilty people and broken people. And, and you're going to, you may be surprised when I share with you some of the results that I, I found when I was going through the scriptures. And one of the reasons is you can probably identify with this one more than you can identify with any other one because all of us are born into this world guilty. The question is, what are you going to do with that guilt? How are you going to deal with that guilt? You can live your whole life feeling guilty and taking it out on everybody, or you can deal with your guilt the way God has prescribed and be free. That's what God wants. So that's what we're going to deal with right now. Now, there's a great example of this in the scriptures. It's found in Luke chapter 23. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Luke 23. And we're going to look at this episode of Jesus on this mountainside hanging on a cross. And he's got two friends beside him. And I don't know that he'd call them a friend. But he's got two people there that he treated with dignity, with respect. He treated them as he would a friend. And, and, and he responded to them. I want you to see it. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 33. It says, When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals one on the right and one on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. 
And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Well, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, Well, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, there was also an inscription above him that said, This is the king of the Jews. Now, verse 39, here's where it gets interesting. One of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God? Since you're under the same sentence of condemnation, we indeed are suffering justly, but we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Wow. I couldn't do that. Could you? Hanging out on the cross, you've been tortured. You've been abandoned by all of your friends. It's just you. And you're hanging there on this cross. There's not a thing you can do except die. Can you imagine yourself looking down at folks and saying, Father, forgive them? Or taking other abuse from the thief on the cross. I mean, if Jesus is God in the flesh, at any moment Jesus could have said, oh, you think so, huh? Poof, you're evaporated there, gone. I mean, he could have done any of that, but he didn't. He could have looked at those centurions and all those folks that were spitting at him and torturing him. He could have said, this is your final day. You're going to regret this. But instead he says, no. You're forgiven. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, what you're seeing when you look at both of these criminals are evidences of somebody who is guilty. They were born guilty, but they also demonstrated it. And so what I want to do is I want to walk you through a description of what it means to be guilty. Also, what does it mean, literally, uh, to be broken? I want us to go through that so you see where you are in this. And then I want to show you how God deals with that kind of a person. And then I'm going to end the message by talking to you about what do you do with friends and neighbors and people you go to school with and people you work with. What do you do with people in those cases who are broken and guilty, all right? So let's just look at this. You've got, there's a listening guide, by the way, inside your worship guide if you haven't found it yet. Pull it out. It's got the statements there. Number one, these are the characteristics of a guilty person. They try to avoid the consequences of their sin. A guilty person tries to avoid the consequences of their sin. It doesn't work, but they are always trying to get out of it. Uh, look, look at verse uh, 39 of Luke 23. It says, one of the criminals who were hanged there. Now stop right there. Just take that phrase. That means the criminal has already been tried, already been abused, already put up on the cross. He's there. The consequences of his sin, he's living out right now. And he doesn't like it one bit, and he's trying to find a way out of this. But he knows that there is no way. That's just how it is. With guilty people, we're, we're wishing that we would have been able to avoid the consequences of our sin. I mean, we're, we're wishing that nobody saw us when we did it, because then maybe it really didn't happen, or nobody will ever know. I mean, when, when we're guilty, I mean, but God says, listen, in Romans 3, verse 10, he says, there is none righteous, not even one. Nobody can say, well, I'm better. No, it doesn't matter how much better you are. You've got to compare yourself to the perfect one, Jesus. There's none righteous, no, not one. Or how about Romans 3.23? All, I'm sorry, it must be misspelled in my Bible here. It must be some. For some have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isn't that what it says in yours? Oh, I gave him the wrong verse, I guess. No. This is God's way of saying you can't avoid it. There are consequences, and you, you know the consequences of sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So we're moving in that direction because of our sin. And, and, but that's not what God's original plan was. He intended for you to live, for you not to die. But it got messed up in the garden way back when Adam and Eve were here. And, and of course, and we can't just blame it all on them because you and I both know we're guilty of sin. And we deserve death. And we're getting a preview of it while we're here on earth when we see people being hurt and abused and treated like dirt and 
You're seeing what death in a relationship looks like there. We see when people are racked with cancer and, and other diseases that there's nothing we can do about it, and you're seeing some of the consequences of sin leading to death physically. There's so much of that going on. So just understand, people who are guilty try to avoid the consequences of sin in vain, but they try. They think that somehow if they can keep it from coming out, that nobody will know, and that makes them a better person. And you're going to find that a better person won't get you any closer to God. Then the second characteristic of a guilty person, they lash out at others. They lash out at others. They, they refuse to take personal responsibility. Look, look at verse 39 again. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him. What? How dare you? This is a crook, a criminal, a thief who's hanging on the cross. He's there because he deserves it, and he's abusing Jesus. He's saying things about Jesus that you're thinking, well, don't you know what's going on here? I mean, that's, you don't want to do that. But when you're guilty, that's what you do. You blame it on your little sister. <laughs> right? You blame it on your dad. My dad wasn't so strict. I wouldn't have all these problems. I mean, you, you, you'll find that you blame everything on everybody except yourself. They lash out at people. I mean, hurling abuse. I mean, this is unfortunate. They take their anger and they use it on others around them. That's what it means to be guilty. You can't help it. You're going to do it. Number three, they blame others for their circumstances. These two are very related. One is you're just out, you have outbursts that are out to attack whoever's around. Whoever gets close, they're going to get burned. But they also want to blame others. They don't want to take personal responsibility. That's why it's interesting. The crook says, look at verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Let, let me put that in another way that, that, that may make a lot more sense here. And you call yourself Jesus, the Christ? I mean, here's a crook looking over at Jesus and saying, <laughs> and you say that you are the Christ. Not, does he, not only does he say it, he is. But this crook, I mean, he's, he doesn't want to take responsibility for where he is, so he's trying to, to somehow twist and distort Jesus and, and make him to where he wants to help this guy. Come on, prove it. If you're the Christ, prove it. You can get me off of this cross here. Yeah, no, you can't. I mean, it's another way of saying, who are you to judge me? How dare you say those things about me? You're, I'm, you know, you're no better than me. That's kind of what's going on there. This, that's what guilty people do. They blame others. They compare themselves to others. I mean, it, it's, it's horrible. It, that reminds me. You, you can't help but feel it. I mean, but look at number four. Write this down. They will do anything for immediate and temporary relief. They'll do anything for immediate and temporary relief. Here's the crook on, on the cross, and he says, come on, you're the Christ. Show your stuff. I mean, if you really are, he's just kind of egging them on. But, well, they're, all, they're looking for any kind of relief because they feel guilty and they know if something doesn't change, they're going to die here. Well, what, I, what it, this reminded me of was this story that I heard about this shoplifter. I mean, he was guilty in the past of shoplifting. He took a lot of stuff from this department store as he was growing up. He never got caught. Now, this is years later, and, and the, the article said that he became a Christian. And so... He became a Christian. He wrote the store uh, a note and says, listen, when I was younger, I stole a lot of things from you, so I'm enclosing a check for $100 for what I owe you. And he sends the check in. But before he sends it in, he has a little PS at the bottom of the letter. He says, if I still can't sleep after this, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> you see, the guy just wanted a little relief. He wanted a little relief. He wasn't really interested in getting things done. When you're a guilty person, you just want the pain to be gone. You want the hurt to be out. You're not interested in getting it right. You just don't like how you feel right now. I mean, the, the, the guilt is like a warning signal. That's, you know, it's an alarm that's just going off saying, something's wrong in you, with you, and something needs to happen. And that's where Jesus comes in. That's why you want to know how to share Jesus without freaking out. Because Jesus is the solution. Now, what's the difference between a guilty person, and a broken person. All right, write these things down on the right-hand side there of your sheet. It, it's, it's the description of the other criminal. Number one, broken people stop blaming others for their problems. They stop blaming others for their problems. Look at verse 40. It says, but the other, the other three, thief said, it says the other answered and rebuking him said, see, again, Here's this crook. He knows he deserves what he's getting. He's going to die for what he did. 
But at the same time, he's taking responsibility. He's not going to blame Jesus or anybody, anybody else. That's why he rebukes this other criminal. There's a second characteristic of somebody who's broken, and that's they begin to see God as holy and just. It's really interesting how he, the next phrase that he uses in verse 40, the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God? That's, that's one way of saying, don't you have any idea what God is really like? How, you wouldn't dare speak that way if you knew that God is holy, that God is just. See, what we've done is we've built a big old box that fits our needs, and we, take, we make a God out of something else, a God out of sugar and spice and everything nice. And we put that God in a box, and we carry that box around because when we get into trouble and we need some help, we just pull out the God of sugar and spice and everything nice, and surely you'll love me and make things better for me right now, right? That is not our God. God does not exist to serve you or me. God is God, and we've been created by God for God. So he has this incredible plan for us. But the word holy in and of itself means set apart. Well, God has set you apart to be what he created you for. So you, you're going to be real careful how you treat him, what, how you talk about him. When, when you're broken, you move out of the realm of guilt into one of repentance that says, I want to treat you, God, like you deserve. Number three, broken people confess their sins. They confess their sins. They, they get honest and upfront about their own guilt. L look at verse 41. And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our sins, for our deeds. He's just flat out saying, we, we're getting what's coming to us. We deserve this. It's sort of like the psalmist. The psalmist had a prayer of contrition this way. Here's what he said, Psalm 51, verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. This is somebody who's broken, who says, I am finished, I am wasted, I have messed up royally. Oh, God, please, just know that I see what you see. And then there's another characteristic. They believe that Jesus died for them. They believe that Jesus died for them. It didn't make any sense any other way. Look at verse 41. We indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve from our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. So that's his way of saying, this man doesn't deserve death. This man should not be dying. This man did nothing to deserve that. We do, so he, in essence, is being killed for our sake. Because there could be no other explanation. And, and, of course, and they understood that in those days, because the Jews... They made regular offerings and sacrifices for their sins. They understood what it was to have someone sacrifice for them, some thing sacrificed for them. They knew that one day there would be a perfect sacrifice, and it's described in Isaiah 53 when it describes Jesus as coming, humbling himself and becoming that perfect sacrifice. That's what's different between a guilty person and a broken person. They understand the solution is not in doing better. The solution is knowing the one who died in their place. And there's one other characteristic I want to throw out in your direction. And that's this. Broken people call out to Jesus for mercy. For mercy. Not for help. Not for improvement. Not for relief. But for mercy. And you know what mercy is, right? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. As opposed to grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. So listen to this. Luke 23, verse 42. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Here's this, this thief on the cross who looks to Jesus and says, I don't deserve any of this, and I, I know I'm the one that deserves this, uh, the sin, I, the, the, the death for my sin. I just, you don't deserve any of this. I'm so sorry. I wish I, there's something else I need. Would you please, I know that one day you, you're, this is all going to be over and you're going to be alive, and would you remember me? You know, I know you, you're, not, you're, you're not in a position where you have to do that. But would you? That's what the thief is saying. Is there any mercy that would be available to me? You can't do better, not better enough. You'll never do better enough. The Bible's real clear about that. You can't do anything but, but accept the mercy of God. Of course, and Jesus going to die on a cross was all about God's mercy. He came, he stepped out of heaven and went to the cross so you and I wouldn't have to die for our sin. Somebody had to die 
And because he's innocent, because he's God, he's sinless, he could literally hang on that cross. All of our sins be placed on him, which is what the Bible teaches. All of our sins were placed upon him on that cross, and he took that final breath. <sighs> and he said, to Tetelestai, it is finished, or paid in full. And he paid in full the demand of justice, which says the wages of sin is death. And he died. Three days later, he came back to life and he says, I did it for you. I offer you forgiveness on the basis of my mercy, not on the basis of you doing better. I offer you my grace, my grace and my mercy. So that's the characteristic of a broken person. So let me answer this question. How does God deal with broken and guilty people? How does he do it? Knowing how he deals with us, the ones who are guilty and broken, will help you in knowing how to deal with others that you're surrounded by. So number one, he won't minimize the truth to deal with sin. He won't minimize the truth. It's, it's interesting, Jesus starts, verse 20, 43, it says, and he said to him, truly I say to you, why did he even add those words there? Why didn't he just say, today you'll be with me in paradise? Why did he say, truly I say to you? It's another way of saying, I want to speak the truth to you plainly. I want to make sure it's very clear to you that what the truth is. And, what, and, and we're faced even today with, there are many people who seem to think that they have to minimize their sin in order to have a chance with God. And God says, no, it's only when you understand how big your sin is to God that you cry out helplessly for mercy. And at that moment, God says, you need my mercy, it's yours. It's a gift. It's a gift because you have chosen to repent of your old ways and turn to him. That God, he won't minimize the truth to deal with sin. He knows the problem. Number two, he will respond immediately when you turn to him. He's not going to say, I'm going to give you three months and see if you really mean it. And some of you feel that way. You're saying, I know he's watching me now, and if I mess up today, I, I've messed up so many times before, there's no way God would ever forgive me after this, and I'm a, please God, don't, don't let me fall one more time. God says, it's not about that. Look at verse 43. He said to him, truly I say to you, day after tomorrow you shall be with me in paradise. Is that what yours says? No. It says today. That's how God works. He knows the moment you move from being guilty to broken, he knows. He says, now, what, what do you want to say to me? And all you can say is, I, I don't deserve anything from you, but I'm crying out for mercy on the basis of the cross. That's it. And he says, all right, today, you're going to be with me. Number three, he will personally get involved in your life. He will personally get involved. He's not going to go to heaven and gather all the angels and say, now, Michael and Gabe, I want you to go talk to Janice over there. I want you to go talk to Tom over there and take care of that. I told him that I'd have him today in paradise with me. You go get him. He doesn't work that way. He goes for you himself. Look at this, verse 43. He said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. So I'll make sure of it. I mean, he's, what he's doing is he's talking about the value of a relationship. God is wanting much more than you just to be washed clean of your sins. He wants you to enter into a relationship with him so that you enjoy him and he enjoys you. He created you for himself. That's what God wants. Let him. Let him. Quit treating him like he's just somebody out there for you to do some things for every once in a while. Let him be with you. That's what he's saying even to this crook, this thief. And then number four, he will restore hope and grant you the gift of eternal life if you turn to him. He will restore hope and grant you the gift of eternal life if you turn to him. Verse 43, he said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. In paradise. You know, the word paradise meant a whole lot of things to the people of Jesus' day. The word paradise here comes from a Persian idea. That when the Persian king wanted to honor somebody, he had these private gardens. And only the person that the, the king of Persia allowed to go in there would be allowed in there. And it was always it was called a, a garden of fellowship. And you would only walk in that garden when you were with the king. So when they heard the word paradise in their mind, they're thinking, this is a promise made by a king that says you get to enjoy all the benefits I enjoy with me. So when Jesus looks at that crook and says, today, you are going to be with me in paradise? Oh, my goodness. It's better than good. 
It's better than the best ideas and dreams that you could ever have. He says, this is the highest honor that God can give anybody. That of having a relationship with Jesus. That's how God deals with broken people who are also guilty. He says, I want the very best for you. So if that's the case, how do you deal with guilty and broken people? How do you share Jesus with guilty and broken pe people? That's on the back side of your note sheet there. Let me give you these four words or five words. Number one, accept them. Accept people. Stop being their judge. Accept them. Treat them as people, not objects. Develop a friendship. Don't accomplish a project. See, as, as long as you see people as something other than a person God's put in your life to develop a relationship with, you're always going to be a little nervous about sharing them the good news because you, you've got an agenda. We, we want to accept them. This is the same thing. I want you to think in terms of, you remember Joseph? Joseph had all these brothers, and they sold him away as a slave. I mean, they didn't like him because he was dad's favorite, and they just didn't like that. And they told dad, they went back to dad and said, dad, an animal apparently has killed him. Here's his robe. It's full of blood. And so they didn't know he was alive anymore for the next 25, 30 years. In the meantime, he ends up in Egypt, and he ends up becoming the right-hand man of the pharaoh. It's, it's an unbelievable story in, in Genesis. And, and then there's a famine in the land, and nobody's surviving except for the Egyptians because of this dream the pharaoh had that, that Joseph interpreted. He says, we need to save up extra food during these times because of this famine that's coming. He says, okay, do it. You're in charge. So everybody's starving. Everybody has to come to him for food. And even the Israelites were starving because they had no food too. So dad sent the brothers to go get some food. And they come and they don't recognize Joseph. They don't recognize him at all. And Joseph does though. And so he does a few things there. There's a whole lot more to this story. But eventually his identity is revealed. They are scared to death. They know they deserve death. They deserve the worst and he's in a position where he could actually do that. But they don't know. And, and Joseph, he doesn't feel that way at all. I mean, he's accepted them. He doesn't like what they did. But he said, listen to this. Genesis 50, verse 20. He, he responds to his brothers who are afraid, now that dad's died, that he's going to kill them. He says, and as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring, up, bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And so he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. That's evidence. That's the making of someone who's accepted somebody. Doesn't mean you condone their lifestyle, their behavior. Doesn't mean that you approve of all the things that they did. It just simply means that you're going to love them. In fact, that brings me to the second thing. Remind yourself that Jesus died for their sin and yours. Remind yourself that he didn't just die for them. He died for you. Because when you see that you come to God the same way he comes to God or she comes to God, that's going to help you as you relate to a broken person. It'll keep you from being condescending and judgmental when you realize that you needed the same kind of mercy that they needed. No different. So easy for us to say, well... No wonder they needed that mercy. That's an axe murderer over there. That's not, I'm not an axe murderer. God says they're all on the same page with me. Sin is sin. And apart from the mercy of God, there's no hope. Number three, forgive them. Forgive them. Jesus said this, and it's hard. He says, if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. You're thinking, man, that's so hard. Yes, it is. But the reason why God says it is because he wants something for you. He wants you to experience freedom. There's no freedom with unforgiving hearts. You're in bondage. God wants you to experience peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. There is no peace when you've got bitterness in an unforgiving heart. He wants you to experience release. You dread seeing those people you can't forgive. When you see them coming, you go the other way. You let them determine and guide your life. Don't go down that road anymore. Jesus says, forgive them. Forgive them. You've experienced forgiveness from God. Let them experience forgiveness from you. And then, number four, love them unconditionally. Love them unconditionally. That, that 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, talks about how that's possible. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from who? 
God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. You know what he's saying there? He's saying unconditional love is an impossible thing for you to share apart from him. What needs to happen is when you give your life to Christ, you're, you're swapping hearts. You're giving him your heart and in exchange for his heart. And when his heart is beating inside of you, that means that you now have the ability to love others the way God loves. That's what he's saying. He's saying you are unable to love unconditionally in and of yourself because we're fleshy. We're sinful. We're guilty. Something has to change. And that's when you give your life to Christ, everything changes. And then that brings me to the last point. When you're going to tell people about Jesus without freaking out, you want to share Jesus sympathetically. Sympathetically. Listen to this. Don't close your Bibles yet. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in, that is within you. Yet do it with what? Gentleness and reverence. The gentleness is a description of how you treat them. Reverence is a description of how you treat him. And God says, you want to reach a guilty and a broken person, you need to know, first and foremost know who God is and what he's like and what, what his standards are and know that nothing you can do will change here standing in his eyes. Only he can do that. You can't do better. All you can do is humbly come before God and say, I deserve the worst, but I believe you, Jesus, died on that cross for me. I believe you died on that cross for even my friends that I don't like. I believe you died on that cross for family members that I do like. I mean, you, whoever it is, it's all based upon what he did. God says, I want you to approach him that way. When you see it that way, then you'll, it'll turn you into the most humble person on the planet Earth because you'll realize what you've got you didn't deserve. And you can't, you can't believe it, that he'd actually pour out his mercy in your direction. Please, have you ever trusted Christ as your Savior? Have you ever taken that first step? It's, the first step is simply admitting that you are guilty. You admit it to God. I'm not God, so you, it's not me that you have to admit it to. You admit to God, I'm guilty, and I fit the criteria. I'm without hope. I, I need you to do something. Otherwise, it's over. And then you remind God that you've heard about that story about Jesus dying on the cross. And you say, I believe Jesus died there not for himself, but for me. And I believe on the third day after he died, he rose from the dead and he offered me life and forgiveness and a second chance. I want to take him up on that offer. I know I don't deserve it, but I, I choose to believe. And when that happens, the Bible says you become a brand new person. You're never to be the same again. He comes, the Bible says, to live inside of you and give you his heart. He does that heart transplant then. That all happens the moment you simply say, I'm guilty, but I believe Jesus died for me. And he said there's enough mercy there on that cross for me too. I accept it. And then once that happens, you're so excited about it and you want to go public. And the public demonstration of you receiving Christ is what you saw a little bit ago in the waters of baptism. When, when you go under the water, it's a picture of the death and the burial of Christ and your personal death and burial of self. And then you come out of the water. We don't keep them under the water. We don't put our foot there, you know, <laughs> sitting on there you know, until they, the last bubble. But we bring them down and we bring them up as a picture of the resurrection of Christ. That's what they're saying. They're saying, I believe in the one who died for me and who's rose from the dead for me. That's it. You will never be the same again if you do that. And then once you do it, then you're in perfect position to share Jesus without freaking out. Hey, let's stand together quietly as I lead us in prayer.